Welcome to the definitive documentary. I'm Catherine Coleman. My name is Robert Pears. In this episode, we're going to look at the powerful life and ministry of this woman who starts out as a nobody in the middle of nowhere. Yet, she would become one of the most powerful voices for God in the 20th century. She was a woman that made many great mistakes. Yet, as she returned, repented, and learned how to yield to the Holy Spirit, God used her incredibly. And so there's a lot we can learn from her, what she did right and what she did wrong, to help us be catapulted into our divine purpose as well. We're going to look at what she said, what historians said, what eyewitnesses and newspapers said to try and get a full understanding of her life and ministry. And I want to start by giving a quote that she gave in 1933. This is when they come to Denver and all they had was five dollars and her uh, her <clears throat> manager turned around and said to her, what are we going to do with five dollars? Her response, if we serve a God limited to our finances, then we are serving the wrong God. He's not limited to what we have or who we are. He can use somebody like me to bring souls into the kingdom. He can certainly use our five dollars and multiply it just as easy as he multiplied the loaves and the fishes for the people on the hillside. Now go on to Denver. Find me the biggest building you can. Get the finest piano available for Helen. Fill the place with chairs. Take out a big ad in the Denver Post and get spot announcements on all radio stations. This is God's business and we're going to do it God's way big. I think you can really capture the personality, the heart, the dramatics of Catherine Coleman and a lady that was big for God. She did everything she did big for God. When she blew it, she did it big. She did it big. But when God was able to get a hold of this lady, restore her, he did something incredibly powerful in, in taking this lady and fully restoring her. I want to share something else that she said. Love is something you do. And I remember very early in my family's uh, conversion how greatly we were impacted by Catherine Coleman and her love message. I will never forget that. And I think in many ways, um, she shared how to develop an intimate relationship with the Lord. In fact, I want to share something uh, that she said regarding her personal relationship with her dad and how that influenced her relationship with the Lord. She said, I had to tell Papa everything. I knew Papa wanted to know. There wasn't a thing that happened that I did not tell Papa. There never was a person easier for me to converse with than Papa to this day. And Papa has been gone a long time. There are things I wish I could run and tell Papa. That's the way this relationship is with our Heavenly Father. It is just as real and just as personal. I never memorized anything to tell Papa. It came spontaneously. And that's the way it is with our Heavenly Father. I believe that her heart was to bring everybody to such a wondrous relationship with the Lord, to bring you to where it was a spontaneous, real relationship and not a religious one. Well, Catherine Coleman was born, born uh, on May 9th, 1907, and she was born in Concordia, Missouri. The term Concordia means harmony, and yet it was anything but. Even within Catherine's family, uh, her family, her, her parents were of different Christian religions, denominations. Yet, when we look at the ministry of Catherine Coleman, where it would end up, she would bring together various denominations with one goal to see the Lord move and to experience the Father. So in that sense, it was almost prophetically speaking of her future. Now, in her early years, her sister would connect with a man who would began doing revival meetings in Missouri. And she would begin to do the music. And what happened is they uh, connected with each other and ultimately got married. They would then leave and go to the Moody Bible School. After that, they then began to be evangelists traveling and holding revival meetings in the Northwest. 
It was while they were in the Northwest, they would meet with a Charles Price. He was a man um, that was brought into the baptism of the Holy Spirit by Amy Semple McPherson. And they would be introduced to the same baptism with speaking in tongues by Charles Price. Well, they would return home um, shortly afterwards to meet with Catherine Coleman. But I need to go back to when she was 14. At the age of 14, Catherine Coleman would have an experience at church where she had an encounter with the Lord. It's in a powerful event which she never would forget. Uh, I believe it occurred around 1155. She remembered the very minute and it shook her to the core of her being. She would say in the future that her call was as real to her as her conversion, which she never forgot. Well, when she was 16 years of age, she hadn't yet finished high school, um, the parents came back and they asked if Catherine could come with them uh, during the summer. And so Catherine joined and they went to the Northwest where Catherine really would begin to be trained in this type of ministry of being evangelist. They went across the Northwest and they didn't see anything initially in Catherine that suggested any call to ministry. But one day um, they see 10 people, I believe, come to the Lord. And Catherine Coleman is outside and she is distraught. There should have been so much more. She's broken by feeling and sensing there were more there that should have come to know the Lord. They see it in her and they suddenly recognize that there is a call inside Catherine Coleman. Now, Catherine was supposed to return back to finish high school, and she goes to the train station, but she cannot get on the train. She feels something pulling her, calling her to stay, and she does. Well, what would happen is because of the sensing of the call, the parents would actually take her to Seattle to a school under A.B. Simpson. Here she would be trained, um, but the problem would be that Catherine Coleman had a wild side to her. And she would keep having these midnight rendezvous. And unfortunately, um, Catherine Coleman, she would fail her preaching class. She would ultimately, in 1926, um, be kicked out of the school because of her late night rendezvous. And they would end up going down to Los Angeles. And it was here in Los Angeles that she actually would go um, and attend some of the Life Bible School classes. Now, there are various testimonies. Some claim that Ralph McPherson, the son of Amy Smith McPherson, recorded there. Some say not. Um, either way, there is a suggestion that she attended some of those, and there is a strong suggestion that she attended services at the Angelus Temple under Amy Smith McPherson. And this, of course, is the glory days. It's the heydays of her ministry. You will see that within Catherine Coleman, she desired to be the next Amy Simple McPherson. She really did have a great love of Amy Simple McPherson, was greatly influenced by her. And of course, it's the 20s. Um, a lot of things are beginning to change, and there's a growing uh, for women's rights, a growing strength for it. We saw the woman getting the vote. We've seen that um, Amelia uh, Earhart, of course, crossed the world in a, in a flight. We've seen the first woman swim across the channel faster than a man. And so there's a lot of things happening and women's rights are coming to the forefront. So now you see this young lady, Catherine Coleman, who's a very strong-willed lady, uh, desiring to do something big as well. But she wants to do something big for the Lord. Well, she would go back to Boise, Idaho. And here she is invited to preach at an old pool hole being converted uh, in downtown Boise. And it would really start her ministry. She would connect with um, Helen Gulliford, who was, of course, a um, musician that had played for Charles Price. Now, her sister had temporarily joined her after a split with her husband, but they would ultimately come back and she would leave. And so now... Um, Catherine and Helen are on their own, and they would form what they refer to as the God's Girls. These two would begin to preach throughout the whole of Idaho. Now, it's the late 20s, and you got to understand that Idaho 
which in many ways still is very rural, was extremely rural at that time. It's not the place that you would think of to start a worldwide ministry. But God was working on this lady, really doing a, a, a grinding. And I wanted to quote some things that she actually said. Catherine Kuhlman said, Many things that happen to us in our lives can be beneficial if we only surrender our own will and desires to God and commit ourselves totally to Him. She also said whether life grinds a man down or polish him depends on what he's made of. A diamond cannot be polished without friction, nor a man perfected without trials. Great pilots are made in rough waters and deep seas. Catherine would also say this, It seems that all I have done is preach and pray and work, and pray some more, preach some more, and work a little harder. You wonder why I know the Word of God as I do. It's because since I can remember, I've searched Scripture. I've been hungry for the Word of God. And we actually see that in these early days where she is, you know, preaching continuously. They would go and they would actually um, stop in every local church. They preached a lot of the local churches. They would really, it's a difficult life for them. They stayed in the chicken cutches. I mean, they would have to wrap themselves with all the clothes and blankets they could to stay warm. It was a very difficult season initially in Idaho. But they traveled, and again, there was a lot of interest because here you have this woman preacher, which is unheard of uh, at the time period. But she becomes and grows in momentum as she continues to preach throughout the whole of Idaho. Now, towards the end, she would actually have an accident where she slips on ice and she breaks her foot. And she's in a cast, and she continues to preach. And in fact, she would stand up and preach for you know, long periods of time. And there was a nurse there was greatly impacted because if you've ever broken your foot and been in a cast, you will know that when you stand, the swelling increases and the pain increases. But nothing stopped her from going. She was just determined and her heart and burden was to see souls one for Jesus. Catherine Coleman said this, Millions of words have been written about success. But if these millions of words could be squeezed out into just three short, meaningful words, I believe the form of success would read faith and gumption. And that really would become, she talked about that gumption word a lot. And that really defined her, particularly in Idaho, where they had to learn a lot of gumption, where it had been easy to quit. Remember that it is also the Depression years. And so there's a lot of stress in many ways. And, and it was not an easy time for a group of girls to travel across this country and preach the gospel uh, and, and have such an impact. Catherine Combe was asked, why did God pick you? Particularly being a woman, why did God pick you? And she said, the only reason I can give you is the fact that I knew I had nothing. And I never forgot from whence I came. When you have nothing and you admit you have nothing, then it's so easy to look up and say, Lord, if you can take nothing and use it, you know, not take nothing, use it. Take my hands, take my voice, take my mind, take my body, take my love. It's all I have. If you can use it, I give it to you. And he has taken my nothing and used it for his glory. And that really was a bold statement because that's what she was about. You look at this woman who starts out as a nothing in the middle of nowhere, is trained in the middle of nowhere, but God was continually to pre preparing her and she was learning how to surrender. She would say this, Dear Jesus, I tried. I didn't do a perfect job. Because I was human, I made mistakes. There were failures. I'm sorry, but I tried. And that would be the statement she'd make of her life. She recognized, I've made mistakes, I'm human. But it's when we realize those mistakes, repent and seek to put them right. That's where the power's at. She also said this, I knew that what God could do if only the gospel in its simplicity were preached. And so she believed in taking the gospel and by the Holy Spirit making it simple. And that was effective. And so, as I said, she preached throughout Idaho, um, through all the cities, all the way up to Twin Falls on the western side, sorry, on the eastern side, which is very predominantly Mormon. But she had a you know, great impact and effect. <clears throat> now, she also made a statement that it's a moment-by-moment -moment faith. And I believe that was really learned. 
by going through great trials and difficulty in Idaho, that she had to learn how to walk moment by moment trusting God. A lot of time, you know, we pray and we expect results, but sometimes it's a moment by moment things of standing and trusting and bringing every thought captive. She also said this, I'm completely dependent on the Holy Spirit. There is no, there is a place in Him, a death. Remember this, Catherine Coleman does not have one thing that God won't give you if you pay the price. It costs much, much, but it's worth the price. It will cost you everything, absolutely everything. And this is the lesson she's about to learn. Because as we go into the 30s, uh, Catherine Coleman now feels drawn to Colorado. And in 1933, they would end up going to Steamboat which is on the north side of Colorado, and here they'd meet up with the Fuchs. Now the Fuchs were a couple, and I hope I pronounced their name correctly, that had come from the um, Stone Church in Chicago. It was founded by one of the leaders from the Zion Church, part of Dowie's work uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. There had been a rebellion where, I shouldn't say it was a rebellion, but people started to stand up against Dowie, disagree with where things were going, and many left uh, in his leadership. And this is one of uh, Mr. Piper, and he would form the Stone Church. Ultimately, he would receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit through multiple steps. And uh, the Stone Church would become the Azusa of Chicago. So the Fuchs now are bringing a, a Pentecostal message into Colorado, and they begin to share stuff with Catherine. Catherine has had her first experience with tongues, someone speaking tongues, I think, I believe in uh, Pacocello, in um, Idaho. So a lot of this is new to her. She had been under ministry of Price. She'd been under ministry of um, her, in, her brother and sorry, brother-in-law and sister. And again, so she's heard a lot of the Pentecostal message. So, in June of 1933, she would then leave Steamboat and move to Pueblo, where she would start a work there, very close to the theater. And, of course, she realizes the theater is a competition towards her, so she begins to add very powerful names to her messages to try to get the interest of the people. And they would start to gain crowds of about 400 people right down on Main Street um, in, of course, um, Pueblo. In August, they plan to now move to Denver. And they have a uh, manager that now works for them, Hewitt. And he would actually take over the pastorship of the Denver Tabernacle later on. But they send him to go find a place. And I quoted at the beginning what she said to him, because they have only $5, to go find the biggest building he can. And the place he found was a warehouse that's on Champa. And that place today is, of course, a hotel. It's gone. There's a hotel there. And as of this message, it is a Marriott. And it's right across the street from the auditorium where Amy Simple McPherson preached. And I also believe that's the place where there's an infamous picture that she took uh, of a sign where she's holding services. Today, that is in downtown Denver, but at that time, it was on the edge, and it was an old warehouse that they converted. And I believe on August 26th, it was finally opened to the public, uh, and it, very quickly, it began to grow, uh, grow and have crowds come. Well, in December of 1934, Catherine Coleman receives news that her father has been killed in a car accident. Somebody accidentally hit him, hit him and he was killed. So she now makes the long journey home from Denver to Concordia, Missouri. At that time, of course, they didn't have the expressways and it was a long, difficult drive home during the winter months. And you can imagine the pain and turmoil that Catherine's going through. This is her father, whom she's very, very fond of, very close to. And when she gets there, um, I want to share certain things that she said. 
She said, I've always been a happy person and Papa always helped make me happy. Now he was gone and in his place, I was battling unfamiliar strangers of fear and hate. I had the most perfect father a girl could ever had. In my eyes, Papa could do no wrong. He was ideal. She goes to the funeral home where she sees her father laid out. And she says this, suddenly I was standing at the front of the church, looking down, my eyes fixed not on Papa's face, but his shoulder. That shoulder in which I had so often leaned, I leaned over and gently put my hand on that shoulder in the casket. And as I did, something happened. All that my fingers caressed was a suit of clothing. Everything that box contained was simply something discarded. Loved ones laid aside. Papa wasn't there. This was the first time the power of the risen, resurrected Christ really came through to me. Suddenly, I was no longer afraid of death. As my fear disappeared, so did my hate. Papa wasn't dead. He was alive. She had been so filled with hate and bitterness at this man that had killed her dad. And it could have literally killed her ministry. It could have had so much of an impact. But in this one instant where God, through the Holy Spirit, touches her, and she realizes her father is not dead, that he is now in heaven, she is set free. And the power of the resurrection of Jesus now in her releases her from all bitterness and hatred and now it, it enabled, it probably saved her life and her ministry. Well, she would return, and what would now begin would be really the dark season of her ministry. It starts off with the great success, her heyday. She is now seeing several thousand people coming to her services. She goes on radio, and she's been very impactful through her radio ministry. Various people like Raymond Ritchie and other great speakers start to come to her churches and, and you know preach for her. And one of those was a Burroughs Waltrip. And Burroughs Waltrip was a man, and I wanted to say this because he was building a church in Iowa, what was said regarding this church in Iowa. In reality, the radio chapel, which was the church, okay, was shaping up to be one of the nation's first seeker-sensitive, media-driven ministries. Although projection screens Disappearing pulpits and indirect lighting are common in America today. These things were unheard of in Catherine Coleman's day. This was an incredible church, well laid out. Everything was very, very expensive. This was said as well. We've already seen that it's not self-effort that ensures this wonderful life of constant victory. Now may I point out another truth, that the victorious life is not an untempted life. So Catherine Coleman said this, and because she knew, having gone through it, what she would preach in her later years was based on having gone through. It's so easy to preach, you know, great wealth and understanding from the Word but when you've gone through and you've discovered the mercy of God, you've made mistakes and now you've had to trust in the word and that word is living to you, there's something different. And God was about to do something for this woman. Um, someone else wrote this, but for a while back in 1938, it seemed like even God was not big enough to handle his headstrong, redheaded handmaiden. For once in her life, she was determined to do things her own way, regardless of what God or his people thought about it. And that's what was happening. She was unmoved by the people. She was unmoved by anything. She was absolutely in love with Burroughs Waltrip. Now, he was a man that had been married, and he divorced. He claimed abuse and other things, and he left. He never went back to his wife and kids. He would leave them. In fact, Later in his life, according to certain historians, um, he would actually end up going to prison for conning people out of money. And that really helps define his character. <clears throat> Someone also wrote this, People who sat under Waltrip's ministry learned that he could preach his sensational dynamic sermons much easier than he could apply them to his own life. To some, Waltrip became the 
personification of Sinclair Lewis's 1927 Elmer Gantry, a fictional preacher who, if created in a later period, would have been a natural in front of a television camera, hawking the prosperity gospel and trinkets from the Holy Land. All the while, Catherine Coleman is falling head over heels for him, but she is under great conviction, and she knows it. And I wanted to share certain messages that she preached during that time period. She said one, titled it, Because I Want To. She explained, God never brings division. God never brings division among His people. Yet what was happening was beginning to divide the church in Denver. Because the people knew, and she knew. And so that conviction is starting to come across. She would say, when you really get God, God's love in your heart, it urges you to be careful about going to sin. It's a mighty constraining influence when you start to go into sin. It will help you determine not to. That love of the Lord should constrain you and stop you. So she's feeling the conviction, which she felt all the way till the end. She is absolutely determined to marry this man. She's head of her heels in love with him, and she's overlooking things. Several people came to her, warned her, told her, don't do it. This is a bad idea, but she refused to listen. She cut off all things and she was determined. In fact, she made a decision not even to tell her church that she was going to get married. She would go back and forth on a regular basis to Iowa to help uh, Borough Waltrip raise money for this church, to do fundraisers with them. And so she disguised the marriage under that took several people with her, including Helen, um, and had a plan to get married. And on secret, on October 16th, 1938, she was married uh, to Waltrip in Iowa. I'm sorry, on the 18th, they were married in secret. This would start a dark period of time for her. Right from the get going, she understood and actually separate and she starts to cry. She realizes that it's a bad decision. She's made a mistake. She is convicted right from the day of marriage. She knows that she has done something wrong. Now, he lived this exuberant life. He lived a life and when it was said of him, uh, his exuberant salary, his living in the Hotel Hanford, a new Buick for himself and a new Oldsmobile for Catherine. They were raising lots of money, but the church was struggling and it wasn't able to cover its costs because of all the money he, he was using and blowing and he was making this very expensive church. He had a big vision for himself and he wanted a big name for himself. But what would begin to happen is the ministry of Catherine would begin to diminish. She left the Denver Tabernacle and of course Hewitt would take over pastoring it and now her ministry would go into decline. It would become referred to as the, the, the deleted years, the years she forgot about, the years that she refused to talk about. And she is totally caught up with this man, but at the same time never lost this deep conviction for the call from heaven. Someone wrote about her, if she chose because of some character trait that made her stubborn to rebel against God's plan for her life, then God simply lightened the check ring until she was forced to comply with his command. In fact, God has a way of taking our rebellion, our sins, our flagrant disobedience, and mold them to our future tensile strength. And that's what would happen. All this rebellion, all this you know, strength of character that enabled her to quench the conviction and go forward would become the strength that would carry her in ministry in her latter years. She also wrote this, if an enemy came, can trap a spiritual giant and halt his effectiveness for God, that is exactly his plan. And the enemy came in at this young lady, she was only 28 when she got married. Um, oh, sorry, when she met Walt Tripp. She was a young man, a young lady, and again, didn't have that spiritual uh, parents to really feed her, keep her, and made a lot of bad decisions. 
No, after the wedding, Catherine refused to stay with her husband, weeping in her room, admitting she made a mistake. However, the Denver church was not so forgiving. They were outraged at the secret wedding, and many believe drove Catherine back into Waltrip's arms. So the response of the church was not great either. And so while I think she would have fled back to the church, they were not forgiving. They felt betrayed, and it only helped push her back into where she was at. Now, Catherine said in a newspaper that she left um, Waltrip around 1952. However, his diaries state that Catherine was going east for a meeting in 1946. Um, sorry, in 1952, she claimed she left him eight years earlier. However, this, this diary report said that she left him in 1946. This will be the infamous meeting where she would leave him once and for all. In 1947, he would file for divorce, claiming abuse from her. She goes on to say, I had to make a choice. Who would I serve, the man I loved or the God I loved? I knew I couldn't serve God and Master. No one will ever know the pain of dying like I knew it, for I loved him more than I loved life itself. And for a time, I loved him even more than God. I finally told him I had to leave, for God had never released me from my original call. Not only did I not live with him, I had to live with my conscience, and the conviction of the Holy Spirit was almost unbearable. I was tired of trying to justify myself. So God has been convicting her, and there comes a day where she walks away. And she talks about a street she walked down in Los Angeles, where she can say the very spot that she died, brokenhearted, she would leave and move on from that spot, a new person, and head towards the East Coast. Now, many people ask, why did she go to the Pittsburgh area? You know, we don't fully know. Maybe she had friends there. Maybe she felt that there was there a warmer welcome. She had to go somewhere where she could start over again. And obviously, Colorado was not the place. Denver was not going to be that forgiven. But she left and she went to Franklin, in Pennsylvania, which is close to um, Pittsburgh. She would declare, I said it out loud, Dear Jesus, I surrender all. I give it all to you. Take my body, take my heart. All I am is yours. I place it in your wonderful hands. And there comes a place in many of us, you know, we've made mistakes of rededication, surrender, and God, I give you all. This would be the heart cry and the critical ingredient in her ministry in her latter years, in her, from the next stage going forward. A life of surrender. Sometimes we have a powerful gift and calling, but it becomes dangerous that we can build our agenda in our ministry. And there must come a day where we surrender, and it's dedicated to the Lord. I give you it, Father. You've given me this great calling. Now use it for your glory. Well, it said she would move on to the um, Gospel Tabernacle in Franklin, Pennsylvania. This was the tabernacle where, of course, Billy Sunday had preached. He saw great crowds. And here she would connect with the man that was the worship leader for Billy Sunday. The person that owned the tabernacle could have deal with her where he had to receive a portion of the money um, that, of the offerings that were given. Well, Catherine Coleman also starts a radio broadcast and has other forms of money coming in. And he wants a cut of that as well. And she disagrees because the agreement was the offerings. This would end up becoming a legal fight and he actually would block her out of the building. And so she is forced to leave and she would go to um, this roller rink where they would convert it and make it a church. And they start to see thousands come to this. She starts to have great success in this. And in the middle of this success, she is invited to go to Pittsburgh. Now, at this time, the war has just ended. Catherine Coleman feels called into the healing ministry. We, of course, knew the healing revival started in 1947. And it's around this time period, and it's interesting, it's 10 years after her break, the, the divorce has just occurred, uh, it's just, sorry, it's almost 10 years after her wedding, and the divorce has just occurred, that all of a sudden the door opens for her in the terms of the healing ministry. And she attends 
um, several healing campaigns by other ministers, and she said this, In the early parts of my ministry, I was greatly disturbed over much that I saw occurring in the field of divine healing. I was confused by the many methods that I saw employed. I was disgusted with the unwise performances I witnessed, none of which I could associate in any way whatsoever with the, either the action of the Holy Spirit or the nature of God. To this very day, there is nothing more repulsive to me than the lack of wisdom. There is one thing I can't stand, and there is one fanaticism, the manifestation of flesh, that brings a reproach on something that is so marvelous, something that is so sacred. So she begins crying and praying about it, seeking the Lord because she does feel led in this way. And of course, the healing revival is breaking, breaking out. Now, most historians typically cut women out and don't really talk about women in the movement, but she obviously played an important part in this time period as well in the healing movement. Um, but she's not traveling around like the great leaders, William Branham or Robert. She said this, there is, a, there is in these divine displays of divine power, a divine tenderness and gentleness more impressive than the miraculous element itself, revealing divine sympathy and love and indeed divine authority. And that was her opinion of it, you know, that you had to see the, the divine sympathy, the, the tenderness of the Lord in it. Well, in 1949, she'd actually see her first miracle. And it was a woman who suffered from a goiter issue. And I want to share that story uh, the testimony of that lady. Mary had her goiter for 36 years. It was 16 and a half inches in width at that time. She was so short of breath she could not walk up the smallest incline without stopping her foot so that she could get her breath. Her whole body was involved and afflicted by the goiter. Not only was her heart extremely bad, but she suffered great pain in her arms and legs. She and her husband had spent a small fortune on doctor bills, hoping against hope that some physician somewhere could help her, but none was possible. The growth was so deeply rooted and enmeshed in her glands that to operate and remove it would cost her her life. Immediately after the death of her husband, she had gone to the doctor and pleaded with him to remove the goiter. On Thursday in May 1949, Mary went as usual to the auditorium. She had, particularly bad, um, she had had a particularly bad and sleepless night, fighting for breath the whole night through. This day, she took a prayer request to the auditorium. The service was nearly over when a terrific pain in the top of her head, and simultaneously she felt something pull and tug at her neck. Instinctively, she put her hand on her throat, and there was no sign of the goiter. This would be launched course, the healing ministry, which we now associate with Catherine Coleman. And it's a very dr dramatically different healing ministry than what we see or saw under Oral Roberts, William Branham, Jack Coe, etc. Catherine Coleman's ministry is now growing rapidly. The demand on her time is growing, and she said something that's very powerful because many heroes of faith, as they became busy, lost sight of the things of the Lord and became bad stewards of their body. For example, taking care of them in terms of sleep. And she said this, I leave with the trust and confidence in my heart and in my mind that as the day, so will God supply the strength for that day. If I were to visualize all my commitments on that calendar, all the services I have scheduled, all the telecasts, all the radio broadcasts I need to make, all the sermons I must preach. If I would picture the load of daily mail before me and all the prayer requests that await me uh, attention on my desk, I would be instantly defeated. But I just don't do it. So go to bed and sleep and commit the thing to God. That's perfect trust. That's perfect confidence. That's where your faith in Him comes in. You sleep. If, anything is going, if anyone's going to do the worrying, let God stay up and worry. Commit it to Him. If anyone has to work during the night, let God work, so that when you awaken in the morning, you have a face, you're able to face the task, you are refreshed mentally and spiritually. She refused to carry the burden, even of all the pressure of ministry, of the demands on her and everything else. She entrusted it to the Lord. Well, she starts to be invited to go to Pittsburgh, and she starts to sense that, you know, she should go, um, and she attends and looks at the Carnegie Hall. Someone said to her, Ah, Miss Coleman, 
We've never filled the auditorium. Even the opera stars can't fill it. Suggesting, you know, that there's no way you're going to fill this auditorium, Catherine Coleman. Well, you don't give her a challenge because she was a person that loved challenges. Someone also said to her, Ms. Coleman comes, sorry, I should, let me report this. This was reported later in a newspaper regarding her at Carnegie Hall. Ms. Coleman comes from no recognized church, pretends only to be an emissary of the doctrine of faith in God. Yet night after night, she is jammed in Northside Carnegie Musical Hall to overflowing. Hundreds have crowded the outer corridors to hear a few fragments of her words. Additional hundreds have been turned away. She's the combination of an orator and the actress, of a songstress and an evangelist. When hymns are sung, her voice rises high and clear above the crowd. I want to read a couple of newspaper articles so you get a sense of her ministry at this time. And one said, they hear in her voice the word of God, the blind see, the deaf hear, and the bedridden get up at her bidding and walk. Someone else wrote, her doubters would like, her to, would like to ignore her. She maintains Faith Temple in Franklin, PA, where as many as 3,000 people swell the population of that town by a third on Sundays. Crowds up to 4,000 visit Tuesday, Thursday, Friday sessions at the Carnegie Hall in Pittsburgh. So at this time period, around 1948, 49, she is starting to gain great success. Now, someone write, would also write of her later on, said this, what makes her unique in her 25 healing year, sorry, 25 year healing ministry and thousands of document cases of healings she's claimed have happened, which are all on file at her Catherine Coleman Foundation in Pittsburgh. But I'm not a faith healer, she said. Uh, I resent very much being called a faith healer. I've never healed anyone. It's the Holy Spirit doing the healing. And I, I want you to understand that from the get-go, this new Catherine Coleman understands the importance of a yielded life in the Holy Spirit. Now, she, as I said, is starting to move to Pittsburgh. But she turns and says, you know, that she's not sure she will move there and that it would take, it said, no, the roof of the faith temple literally would have to cave in before I'd move, I believe God wanted me to move to Pittsburgh. Well, on Thanksgiving Day in 1950, guess what happened? A snowstorm and the hall roof fell in. And so she officially moves to Carnegie Hall. In the 1950s, she would start to see her ministry would become international and a lot of success would grow. She also started to say that um, she wanted to be the next Amos Simpson McPherson. She would stated that she didn't build churches, but the reality is that the Catherine Coleman Foundation did actually support, start, help uh, various ministries, churches worldwide. Um, <clears throat> Amos Simpson McPherson's had a great impact on her, and it's absolutely no doubt. So while she wasn't like Amy C. McPherson in starting all these churches, she did have a great impact. And you see a lot of Amy C. McPherson definitely rub off on Catherine Coleman. The theatrics um, and many other things really began to show. Four years after the death of Amy C. McPherson, Catherine Coleman started to make the limelight in the newspapers, much like Amy C. McPherson. So what were her meetings like? Let me give you some testimony from her meetings. The praise choruses that Catherine used in her services were her way of expressing to the Lord the deep felt feelings of love she had towards him. As a mere mortal, she knew that through the music she and all those participating with her could have a heavenly experience. So as they worshiped, and that really became, you know, she didn't often go around praying over people, laying hands on people, much like you see in the healing lines at Or Roberts and such like. She would pray, and she would just speak and pray and worship, and as they worshiped, God began to heal people all over the auditorium. And it could be this person, that person. Sometimes she'd point to a section and, and speak something, and God would begin to move in that section of the auditorium. But there was an overwhelming experience with the presence of God as they worshiped. Very simple, beautiful songs. 
Um, another example is this. You knew from the moment Catherine Coleman moved onto the stage of a great auditorium like the Shrine that she had come with one purpose in mind, the worship her holy God. And she came, and that was at very much where she brought you in with her to worship the living God. As I said, worship was really at the center of everything she did. Let me give you another example. It is a worship setting that miracles began to take place. When we sing words like, I see stars your hands have made, you are an awesome God, we realize that if He could create the world, He certainly could deal with our greatest problems. One of the songs I sang during Catherine's services was, He Touched Me. I have to admit that I often had great difficulty completing this worship song because I would be watching the hands of the healing group workers who were praying for the sick during this time and then seeing the Holy Spirit touching the sickest of sick at that very moment. So somehow the songs were part of the Holy Spirit touching and moving and ministering to people. As they worshipped, they stopped speaking negative words, they stopped focusing on their problems, they stopped focusing on what they were going through, and they began to get their eyes on the Lord. They began to declare who He was, and they began to declare the promises of God. They began to open up and yield and allow the Holy Spirit to move. So what was the secret of Catherine Coleman's power? She said this, one of the greatest lessons that the world has to learn is how to yield oneself to the Holy Spirit. It's one of the hardest lessons that I've had to learn. It was about learning to yield to the Holy Spirit. She also said this, the secret of those bodies that were healed and those miracle services is the power of the Holy Spirit and that the only part I play is in yielding my body unto Him. He works through that body in lifting up Jesus, but the vessel must be yielded. I become completely detached from what happens uh, during a miracle service. It is almost as if the person of Catherine Coleman is seated with the crowd in the auditorium. As a person, I become completely separate from what the Holy Spirit is doing. Thousands have marveled that I can go through an entire service, sometimes as long as six hours, without stopping, always on my feet, never being seated once. And yet at the end, I can walk out that platform just as refreshed as I went on at the beginning of that service. Doctors have told me that from a medical standpoint, it is impossible for any human body to take that beating year in and year out. In fact, I can turn around and do it all again. I tell you the secret. It's because Catherine Coleman um, doesn't do it. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me preach an hour under that anointing of the Holy Spirit and I will walk off the stage more refreshed in body and mind than I was walked on the platform. There's a refreshing for my body as he fills the body with himself and his own spirit. And we see at the end that a lot of times she struggled physically, but when she get up on the stage, something would take over and she would just begin to preach and minister for hours. Even though her body at this point was weak and frail and struggling, Catherine Coleman somehow under the anointing became a, a radically different person and was able to really minister for such long period of time with power. <clears throat> Now, I want to share this, that she stated she died a thousand deaths. When she finished the service, she would look and she would see those that didn't get healing. And regarding that, she said this, But after the service, I die a thousand deaths because many leave unhealed. I say to myself, should I have yielded up myself to the Spirit even more? Should I have held the service five more minutes? Sometimes I wish I had never been called because of the great responsibility. I feel responsible for those who are not healed. Broken by what she saw, disturbed because her heart was always that every person in that service would get healed and felt a responsibility that she had to go after the Lord, that she had to surrender, had to yield, even for these long services that were wearing physically on her body, long term, she was sold out to the Lord. She also said this, in order to make this as simple as possible, you must realize that prayer involves a relationship with God. She said there's no greater power that God has given any human being than the power of prayer. But there can be no real praying, and you cannot know how to pray until first of all you realize that wonderful relationship that you have with God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And she would explain that all comes through the cross and acceptance of Jesus as Lord and Savior. So that was the critical thing. But your whole life, your prayer life must be built upon that and a relationship with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit.
As I said, she desired to be the next Amy Simple Pearson. And as I said, she built many churches. There were a lot of similarities to it. Um, she would claim later she never met Amy Simple Pearson, which is very possible, though we do know she attended the church. And there were a lot of clear similarities between them. And like Amy, they were both pioneers, breaking forth, particularly for women in ministry, um, really taking ground in the terms of radio, and they had phenomenal success. I mean, you look at Billy Sunday, a phenomenal evangelist that had great power, drew great crowds, yet Catherine Kuhlman drew greater crowds at that gospel tabernacle. So there was a great power in this lady um, that was built over the many years and through all that she went through. Now, people have asked, what was she like behind closed doors? And one person, David Wilkerson, said he likened her to the General Booth, uh, William Booth, founder of the Salvation Army, a bellowing bull of a man who had no patience with those who did not believe the way he did or were unwilling to do the work of God the way he wanted it done. It was the same unyielding intensity that Catherine conducted her ministry and ran her office. I don't change my theology, nor will I change my methods, she said dogmatically. And so she would have things done a certain way, even though new technology would come along, it had to be done a certain way. This is the way she always did it. This is the way it's going to be done. And she was fully in control. Now, at the same time, if you were to visit her and come into her office, she would be so wonderfully graceful towards you that she made you feel like you were a prince, you were royalty. You were the most important person at that meeting. And she took time. She listened to you and she honored you. And even though she was at this point in time a great celebrity, a great success, there was in her no sense of greatness over you. There was a true humility in her. Now, as we go, of course, in her latter years, she was seeing great success. And some of the things that she did, for example, she would visit and meet with the Pope. She got a Vietnam a Medal of Honor. And many of these things people didn't like, didn't sit well with many people. And it caused great persecution. At the same time, she also experienced betrayal, including from her worship leader, Dino, a man that she found and brought him in from nowhere and now raised him up. She dressed him well. She exalted his name and opened the doors and really brought him to a great ministry. Her, the brother-in-law as well, who was now the most paid, per, well paid, per, the best paid person on her staff, these two men would come after her demanding better payment. Um, and they would sue her. Well, she would end up having to fire them. Because one of the greatest weaknesses Catherine had is she didn't take a lot of time to study your character. She had a great trust of people, great love of people, and she just trusted. And she would often be uh, betrayed. But she never allowed that betrayal to get in her, uh, to impact her heart, or allow it to steal her uh, from her ministry. She'd been through a lot of stuff. Well, she starts, she does travel the world. She gets highly involved and visits many big um, conventions, uh, conferences, uh, churches, and she's actively involved in the Full Gospel Men's Business International meeting. Uh, she hears about a meeting where Bob Mumford is going to attend, and she refuses because she's very outspoken against the shepherding movement and refuses to have anything to do with it. So she's a very outspoken woman and now a celebrity. She appears on several TV shows. Uh, and her radio broadcast, when you look at them, she had a unique way. They were not religious or stuffy, but were very inviting. And she had a unique ability to make you feel comfortable, pulled in, and she could just minister to you in a very soft and wonderful way. There was a lot of worship with her, um, and it, it really drew a lot of people. Well, as I said, she also played a key role in the charismatic renewal movement. And during that time period, obviously, her name and her ministry were at its highlight. Well, as we get to the mid-1970s, uh, she started to, to struggle. And in the late 1975s, I think on the 16th of November, around that time period, she would do her final crusade. When she finishes, she stops after everybody's gone and looks through the various areas of the auditorium as if knowing this was her last meeting. Something inside her clicked and told her it was over. Three weeks later, she would end up in hospital. And Or Roberts would actually visit her and wants to pray with her, but she refuses and explains to him she's tired, she's going home. And it would be in February of 1976 that Catherine Coleman would be promoted to heaven. We look at her life in ministry, and Catherine Coleman, again, as I said at the beginning, was an imperfect woman. She made some major 
mistakes. That so often you make a mistake, you're put on the bench and you have to be restored and it can take year after year after year. But when we look at God, when we repent and we return to Him, He puts us back into ministry. He pushes us for us, much like Peter. And if we'll learn to walk, yield it to the Holy Spirit, because if we're right, if the heart's soft, and He can trust us. See, God's faithful. He knows He can trust, and He puts us back in. He was able to take this woman and take all those strengths that had allowed her to go wrong and tempered them now. So they became critical ingredients that despite persecutions, difficulties, she always pressed forward. She never quit and she never stopped. She would finish the course on top. You know how many of us can say, you look at many heroes of faith, they went through golden years and then they declined. She started off strong, slipped, but then finished on top. What a glorious thing. And how many people stand today impacted that are here because of her ministry. She had a great impact on my family and on my early walk with the Lord, and I'm very grateful for her ministry. So I look at her, and she was a great blessing to the body of Christ. I look at her today as a person that has made mistakes, and she encourages me. And I've discovered that God is the God who restores, and He can take nobodies from the middle of nowhere if we will simply learn to walk in obedience and by faith and have some gumption with us. We cannot imagine where God will take us, We serve a bigger God than we can think of. I pray that her life story blesses you, encourages you, provokes you, and that you would get some gumption and a boldness of faith and dare to believe our big God to do big things in your life. Amen. Please check out some of our other videos, other documentaries, and may they also bless and encourage you. We are living in exciting times, and it's time for us to step up and fulfill the high call of heaven in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.